As for you, fellow Christian, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. Hey, welcome to Standing in Faith. My name is Kat, and I'm in the studio with Jeff. Here I am. David. Hey. And Bill is back again this week. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Yay. So, last week, we were talking through Kohlberg and his model that we're applying to maturity. And we went through levels one, two, and three, which were reward and punishment, the marketplace exchange, and social conformity. Today, I'm hoping that we can cover levels four, five, and six, and which is going to bring us to the conclusion of the Kohlberg model. Um, and maybe at the end, if we have enough time, we'll kind of see if we can get some examples to kind of step through all the la all layers with examples. Um, that, that's at least what I'm hoping for today. So um, let's start with defining layer four, which is the, the law and order section. Law and order. It, I was looking at the, the schema here, reward and punishment, marketplace exchange, social conformity, and law and order. And they, there's a common theme there that, that the, the authority or the rules are imposed, that they're set down and we are to conform to them. And so there's that, that whole kind of um, an eye for an eye uh, reward and punishment kind of uh, theme that runs throughout law and order that that laws are are set up and to keep order but they they may or may not conform to the actual uh, design of nature I mean for example to give, give a good example of this um, a law can be made that uh, marijuana is legal and you know that people can conform to that and obey that. But that doesn't replace the laws of nature, the design laws, which um, in, in marijuana, if you take it, and I'm a, <laughs> I'm a good example since I was uh, hooked on marijuana for many years, but it does damage. I'm convinced of that. It did damage to my mind, and it took a while to recover from it. And so that even if you make a law that says something is right, it, if it, it may or may not conform with how reality actually is. Right, mm -hmm. right. Kind of think of laws or law and order. You kind of say it is. There's there's an authority that's right. been granted some level of authority, right? So that it's operating. It creates rules, and those rules are supposedly for the betterment of all. Um, and I think, and and I'm not picking on governments, but government are. Our, our local government, our county government, our state government, our federal government are examples of law and, law and order, right? It's to hopefully, right, it's so that we're not running around killing each other. There's a law that says you don't do that. It's a restraining influence mm -hmm. over everyone. Yeah. I, I know I keep picking on driving, but there's all kinds of laws about driving, right? And, we drive on the right-hand side of the road. That's so that there's not a lot of traffic accidents because people are driving on whatever side of the road they want to. Um, so I'm not saying that law and order are a bad thing. I'm, I, all I'm proposing is that law and order is built on those other levels as well. You kind of hinted on that, right? We need some social conformity. Everybody needs to drive on the right-hand side of the road. If we lived over in the UK, that would be flip-flopped. But just as long as there's conformity socially that it's okay it's acceptable 
Um, and yeah, we do that so we don't have traffic accidents and we don't have insurance rates that go through the roof. Mm -hmm. that, that's an example of those four layers in operation. All right. And the thing I think that, that when you look at those and you think of the scripture that Cat read is it goes down the, the, the whole listing of different scenarios. Um, and you can go to Romans, too, where it talks about how the law exposed sin. Um, in the, in the comp you know, I mean, when you look at the law of God, it exposes sin. Um, so, you know, what do you do with that? Because there's no way in the world we can keep the law. If you think that being good and doing good things are going to create some model in heaven for you to get there, to please God or whatever. Um, no, because it, 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 takes, it, it just takes one sin to nullify the whole law completely. And I love it where it says, but God in his great love for us implemented the whole um, beautiful thing where where Jesus becomes our our lamb who takes away the sin of the world um, and it wasn't to wipe an angry scowl off God's face either or, you know God's horrible wrath and Jesus poured out God poured out his wrath on God no no he poured out his wrath on sin in itself so when we think of think of this I can't help but think if we kind of bring it back into the world of church and and all of that kind of stuff that there when someone sins there's this there's this to me an immature response that says well they need to be punished for this you know they sin they need to be punished but the wrath of man doesn't bring about the righteous life that God desires exactly exactly and and that, and that is a place where I think we get to that, that when we have this sense of, well, they need to be stoned, they need to be whatever, we've missed that place that says, but God and his great love for us. And, and we forget the fact that, no, God operates in grace. God operates in a healing. He wants to bring healing. So if someone sins, God doesn't want to pour wrath out on him in judgment. God wants to bring healing to that. I mean, it's a whole purpose in, in the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world to bring healing and wholeness and restoration uh, to his creation. That's God's design law as opposed to what we were talking about before, the imposed law. Well, I think a lot of a lot of times it's easy to get stuck and that is because we've been educated and brought up and weaned <laughs> for lack of a better word right in in law and order and those other layers um, right so we our society runs on these layers um, so I, I remember and, and this is a funny story but I remember when when we first moved down to North Carolina, um, Liz was on her way to a job interview. She was driving down the road, and she got pulled over. The road changed from 45 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour. She didn't know that or recognize it, and she also didn't realize that there was a school zone on top of all of this. So she's just driving down the road. She gets pulled over. Um, no, she didn't get the job because she was all wound up right she she got a, the speeding ticket and um somebody said to us oh well you should you should ask for a, a prayer for mercy a prayer judgment. for judgment mm -hmm. and we're like what's that that's what is that and north carolina law has this mm -hmm. mercy clause where if it's your first offense they'll they'll <clears throat> they'll I, i'm hesitate to say grace it but they'll say okay it's your first offense we're gonna set it over here, and if you don't do any more, we'll we'll just we'll wipe that one off. You get a clean slate. Um, so I remember I, this was so we made the mistake. We should have hired a lawyer. We didn't. 
We show up in this courtroom, huge courtroom, full, full. The courtroom was full of people, right? And they they call Liz's case number, and Liz has to walk up front, and and the judge looks at Liz and says, well, what's your plea? And Liz is like, well, I want a prayer for mercy. That's not a plea, ma'am. You, I mean, the judge banging the gavel, right? I mean, it was this whole big thing, and Liz was just sitting there with big eyes like, I don't know what to say. Finally... The judge was like, look, I'm not your lawyer. I cannot advise you on your plea. That's what lawyers do. I'm a judge. I provide a ruling. And Liz is just sitting in her eyes. She's barely holding it together. She wanted to cry. She's like, and finally she's like, guilty? Aww. She like, just like, Aww. I, I don't know, it. guilty? <laughs> That's it. There you go. Guilty? It's over. And the second she like, Ugh. guilty? Right, the judge bangs the oh. gavel, dismisses it in in a second. Um, anyways, I, I share that story because <laughs> I, I think we're I like, like we're seeped with this idea of law and order. We are. So then it only becomes natural, keyword natural, for us to apply that same to God's law. Yeah. When in fact, I think you said it, God's law already has that provision built in for everything, not just a speeding ticket, right? It's got that merciful, graceful, got you covered already built into it. However, we want to live out of the law and order side, and and that's because that's the way we process this stuff. So I think for... It, it, as it relates to maturity, I think this is one of those steps where it's so important to understand that there's this whole spiritual law of life built into this, that God, what you said, but God, in his grace, rose up above this all to take us out of that. Um, unfortunately, I think we've we often get stuck in this law and order side where we see something that's a rule that's been broken and there's a punishment for it mm -hmm. and we want to punish ourselves true that happens too yeah yeah well sometimes though when we say but god it, it's the god that we may have created in our own mind i mean we we are landfills of lies about god and our own identity right. um but uh you know, the, the saying I, I shared with you earlier is that, that God created us in his own image and likeness, and we've been returning the favor ever since. We make God into our image and likeness. Example, I grew up in a, in a very legalistic uh, Roman Catholic church, and this is not against Roman Catholicism, but I grew up, and I somehow created a God in my mind that he was a, a kind of monarch sitting on a throne with a scepter and a gavel and he was just trying to find me doing something wrong. And uh, that was the God, but God sits on his throne waiting for me to do something wrong. He wasn't a God of mercy, he was not a God of grace. And I grew up with the whole uh, you know, punishment, uh, substitutionary model of atonement, and now I've, I've discarded that as unscriptural because the image of God, I've had a lot of lies taken away about who God is, and and he is oh here I I actually brought something that if if I was years and years ago the first kind of God I was talking about if I would have given a descriptive title to the Bible it might have read something like this crime punishment salvation and it would be subtitled sinners in the hands of an angry God mercifully saved from eternal damnation that would have been my title for the Bible. Now, the title would look more, more like this, Redeeming Love, the Restoration of Humanity into the Family of God. I mean, that God, I can say, but God, who is a God who is much more interested in restoring me to the family uh, than he is in punishing me. And, and, you know, an example is if I, if I was, you know, g trying to commit suicide, he would not be interested in punishing me because taking my own life is bad. He would want to do something to intervene in that process. 
because he wants me alive. He's got plans for me. Well, a lot of people are walking around. They don't have an idea of God that is the restorative God. It's one that is interested in punishment. And, and we could go into the whole history of how that developed in the church. But, but needless to say, we need to have an accurate scriptural description, understanding of who God is when we say, but God. Well, when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, this, this is from the Ephesians passage I read at the beginning, we were following the ways of this world. We were gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts where the flesh wants to do it all on their own or, or punish your own, be your own judge and punish your own self and, and, and or redeem your own self. Like, you know, even the idea of um, like evolution, we, we, we created our own selves by the power of our own selves. Like we crawled out mm -hmm. of the slime, you know. Um, so I see that as, yeah, we already were in, de like it says in, um, in Romans 5, it says uh, death was already reigning from the time of Adam the, to the time of Moses. So we were already, like, that's it. Like, we were already objects, objects of wrath by nature. Like, our nature was that. And then God would pull us out of that and redeemed us from and put us into his family. Like, we weren't born in his family. We weren't born, we were made in his image, but we weren't born in his family. He adopted us and pulled us out of the world and put us in his family. I, I just sort of love that. I've just really been thinking and, about that a lot. I love that. And I like the, the idea, instead of sinners in the hands of an angry God, sinners in the hands of a loving God. Hmm. You know, to me, that just resonates so much um, much, so much better. So I'll, I'll jump in and say for, for the first four levels that we've talked about, um, it, I would describe our motivation as self-centered, right? We're, we're focused on self in these things, right? We, we want to avoid punishments and get rewards. We want to exchange things to satisfy our needs. Um, it's self-centered, right? We want to we want to belong and be part of and conform to some social cultural group. So we do that, and then that's self-centered. And it's also self-centered that we're kind of focused on law and order, right? We 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 want to follow the rules, uphold the laws so that we don't receive a punishment or, or feel righteous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and we forget that whole passage that says i will write my laws on your heart yeah. you know and and what does that mean it means that that what happens to us when this but god in his great love for us because of that great love for us and our ability to see God in mercy and grace being poured out on us, there's a deep desire then in our hearts to want to please God yeah. instead yeah. of instead of you know constantly rebelling against his, his his rule and whatever. But we don't we don't have this thing. Oh, if if I mess up, oh my God! And that's where I think condemnation comes in. You know, what is it that that the spirit of the law of life has uh, spirit of the law of life has set us free from the law of sin and death? It's kind of like the difference between gravity and aerodynamics. You know, was it that we were we were pinned to this by gravity? It was we were stuck in that. Mm -hmm. But you take the law of aerodynamics and it defies the laws of gravity. And, and that, that's exactly what happens when, when, but God in his great love for us, and we have this amazing view of this merciful, loving, kind God, um, it, it changes our whole, our whole attitude and mentality about how to live. Mm -hmm. We're kind of bleeding over in, 
it's interesting how this discussion is flowing, right? Mm -hmm. We kind of bled out of level four in the Kohlberg model, law and order, and we're starting to, to, to find ourselves in level five, which is love mm -hmm. for others. Yeah. And it's interesting because at this stage in the Kohlberg model, the motivation switches to one of self-giving rather than self-centered. Humility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And remember, we said this a long time ago that all the, I think it's Andrew Murray that I got this quote from, was that all the graces are sown in humility or grow up out of humility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the good soil from mm -hmm. when we went through mm -hmm. parable of the sower. But yeah, now, now you're, Dependency is not on yourself. It starts to switch to being God-dependent. And your awareness switches from self-centered to self-giving. In other words, you start to become more aware of, of God and what he's doing. And your motivation becomes others rather than yourself and God, Yeah, ultimately. And, and, and expressing that same love and mercy that you experience expressing that on others in the same way. I don't think I started moving out of that level four to five <clears throat> until the image I have of God was changed such right. that um, a lot of fear had to be uh, released, gotten rid of, because when you're in those first four levels, you're totally gripped by the fear of doing something wrong, of punishment, and so forth. It's completely fear-based. So as uh, my idea of God being a restoring God, a loving God, not just interested in finding me doing wrong, as that began to shift in my soul through inner healing and being exposed to the Word and being in a you know, Christian community and so forth, it was a gradual process. But fear began to be released. And once fear is, fear is a very constricting force, it pulls you into yourself. There's nothing like fear to make you very self-centered. Um, and, and once you, that starts dissipating, the fear, then it was like a whole new world opens up. And um, so at the right time, you know, God just led me towards saying, okay, you want to know more about who I really am? Expose yourself to uh, Eastern uh, Orthodox theologians. Go, go take, a, take a look what the early church said about me. They weren't focused on penal substitution. They were focused on restoring the union that was broken through the fall, that you were created to be with me. It's, family. it's just a whole different idea of God being like the head of a large family, and he wanted me. I mean, my, my greatest inner healing was, was it, it had to do with Galatians 4, um, 7, in which I didn't believe that God really loved me. I thought I had gone over the limit and I couldn't really be in my years of rebellion. But he showed up in the Word in, in a healing session. He said, you're no longer a slave, you're my son. You're my son. So it was like, I'm your son that you love, that, that you're not going to punish me, you just want me to be with you. I mean, that idea started dawning on me and creeping into my soul. And that's what released the enabling possibility to move into a consideration really for others rather than myself. Mm -hmm. As a tie into what Kat had said earlier, right? It's, it's God releasing the Holy Spirit yeah. in such a way that you, you have a spirit of adoption into his family. And that adoption is what allows you to cry out, Abba. Mm -hmm. Oh, that dissolved a lot of fear. It's intimate. <laughs> Yes, right? yes. It be started to be, become, even as I talk about it, that inner healing is like the first day of my life. Aww. That's how I feel. It was the first day that I had a, a real sense of belonging. Maybe it and was before then, I again. didn't really have that. Huh? <laughs> Maybe that was the moment you were born again, for real. Possibly, yes, even though I, I thought, it, you know, there were earlier moments and so forth. But that one, yeah. And, and it, it was a, a direct speaking that those words, those words of Galatians 4, 7 just came alive like somebody was speaking them. In uh, Ephesians, I've been looking at the first couple chapters of Ephesians a lot lately. 
Paul, he's writing to people in Ephesians who already, they have already believed, they, they were included in Christ. This is all in the first part of the chapter. They believed, they, they had the Holy Spirit. But then he further writes, he's like, I keep asking that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you. So it's so you can know God better, so you can know the hope to which mm -hmm. he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So there's all this, there's just more stuff than just like the little, the little sprouts, you know? Well, you know, you go back to the whole series we did on the names of God and and how all of those names fit such a, a, a beautiful description of God towards us. Yeah. He's the God that's there. He's the God that, that provides. He's the God of shalom and peace and wholeness. And all of that fits into this whole idea of God's design to, to bring us into a, a place of healing um, ultimately. And restoration. And restoration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because, it, it, yeah, he wants to restore yeah. intimacy that was lost from the garden. It's that period. I mean, isn't it interesting how much God desires that intimacy with mm. us? Right. God desires that. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's just so sweet to think of that. Well, that's the real law, isn't it? It's the law of love. That's what runs the whole universe, and he is love. And so once we're back with him, it's that that's what's restored. It's like the circle of love is restored. We're forgiven for the breach of trust and all the sins and everything. But he gets inside and changes our nature. Like he designed us to be loving people. And so when we start returning his love, we're completing the circle. I know we're getting into the next layer. We were layer. already there. I'm, I'm sitting here <laughs> we're smiling. We're at the next layer going, of maturity. Wow. <laughs> this is just. But it's got to finally get the return is the law of love. So, and that's intimacy, you know. So it's complete. That, and that, he just breathes a great sigh of relief, I'm sure. But, you know, when, oh, my. My, you know, like the prodigal son's father. He's back, and you run out to meet him. He, mm. He's back. That, that, that's all I want. Mm -hmm. You know, and the other son's saying, is, well, he's the penal substitute. He's like, well, no, he's got he's to pay for squandering the whole inheritance. There's got to be some repercussions. There's, there's the punishment model. And the father says, no, no, he's lost and he's found. He's dead and he's alive. We're going to have a party. And there you have the picture of restoration and intimacy and the law of love returned. Mm -hmm. And Jesus tells that story. Well, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it goes into our mission statement, which is a heart, a, a real desire for this to take place, is to know Jesus intimately, to be fully empowered by the Holy Spirit, to take the heart of the Father to all peoples, to love others well in the way of Jesus, and create loving environments for all to encounter Jesus. And, and you know, I know, of course, we're, we're not there, but that's, that's our heart. That's our mission. That's where we're headed. And, you know, that's that, that whole top of the ladder maturity model. That's the law of love applied. Law of love. You just read the law of love applied. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I like in 1 John 4, it says, this is love, not that we loved God, we didn't do it on our own. It wasn't our own righteousness that attracted him to us, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So since God loved us, then we also ought to love one another. So it's, 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 a, um, it's really a way of glorifying God by loving one another because he loved us. We bring glory to him by loving each other. Yeah. It really mm. glorifies God. And of course, really... In reality, the only way for us to love each other is by God working in us mm -hmm. to do that. And you mentioned it earlier. Now we're really getting to the next level mm -hmm. yeah. of maturity. Yeah. How, do, how are we able to really love? What does it really mean? Are we able to pull that out of ourselves, or do we need the enabling power of God? And to start us off probably for next time, that's why I believe Jesus came. 
that he came to enable us to love. And that Christian, real Christian maturity, as I would put it, is becoming the likeness of Jesus. That's that's what Christian maturity is. That that's we're what becoming we're talking about more, next time. That's yeah. the whole idea just, for next right. time. Um, I'm wondering if we might be able to get some examples and step through all these six layers of the Colbert model. I I have one. It's kind of rough. Um, and examples of what <laughs> you mean? The thinking and the thought process that goes along on each one of these. Oh, like a time in our life when we. We were making a decision that wasn't based on truth, but we like acted a certain way or thought a certain way, like that. Let me give you an example. Okay. And see, so, and this is this is just an idea, um, and and the idea is, I, I I'm gonna pick on you, Bill. I'm sorry. All right. Go for um, it. I I I'm gonna walk up and sock Bill in the nose, um, and at the reward and punishment layer of things. Um, it, it's not wrong unless I get punished. Like if I punch you back in the mouth. Well, you could <laughs> maybe swing back, but that I think would be level two. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it, it's not wrong. I, I'm strong. I'm healthy and I'm right. Apparently I feel like you should be punished for something. So I'm going to sock you in the nose. Um, now, unless if I get punished for doing that, it's not wrong. Um, now, layer two of that same, um, it's not just wrong, but it's proper that I popped you in the nose because you deserved it. You didn't fulfill something that I thought that you should do for me, and... Um, you didn't uphold your end of our bargain, so I'm going to sock you in the nose for it. Um, yeah, I, I have just cause. Now, that's level two. Level three on the same thing says not only is it not wrong and not proper, but culture says it's not wrong for me to do that. Level four, which would be law and order. You broke your agreement with me. I have the right and I deserve to hit you for doing that because you didn't follow the rules. And because you broke the rules, justice was administered. <laughs> You're not Jesus. <laughs> well, I, I, hey, I'm not saying that I'm giving I know, you I know, examples I know. <laughs> of, of how we, act, we try to yeah. act like Jesus. Yeah, yeah, that's idolatry. Right? Now, now I'm starting to move into level five. It is wrong for me to just walk up and sock you in the nose, even if I had all those other reasons, because it, it's actually a violation of God's love for us. So I might not have violated society's laws, but now I've gone and violated one of God's laws, right? So that makes it wrong. Um, but even then... It's still one step more um, is now I've, I've gone the opposite of what God has done for me, right? I would need to pivot and, and give you an equal amount of, of grace. So let me share a little story, and then y'all can apply whatever it is to all of this. Okay. I was a little boy. We were in what was called night church. It was at night, and, and uh, my daddy was actually officiating. All the different missionaries would officiate this night service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was standing next to, while we were singing. I was standing next to a friend of mine, and um, we got tickled about something. And during the song, we were just, we were laughing. We couldn't stop. It was just like, whatever. And then when everything quieted down, I sat down. My dad looked over at me and says, get up and go home. Just like that. Uh, because I was acting up. So get up and go home. Because I embarrassed him. And so I went home. Went home with a lot of fear, too. But I was ashamed I was, uh, you know, 
So I got up in front of everybody, went home. I got home, when he got home, then it was a spanking mm -hmm. on top of that. And, you know, and, and in my mind, I'm still trying to figure out what it was I did that was so, so horrible. You know, I was in church, I was having a good time. But anyway, that's, that's looking back on it. But then that's, that's kind of how it ended. And, you know, I, I went to bed, um, you know, crying and, and shamed and all of this other kind of stuff. So what does that look like when we, when we look at this? I, I see uh, a violation of social conformity and law and order. I see someone that, uh, from your father's perspective. I'm sure that's what he was thinking, right? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a leader, and I'm I'm unable to even have any type of influence or quote unquote control over my own family. It looks bad for me when my own son's misbehaving, right? And yeah, that's socially acceptable behavior during one of these night services. Clearly, wasn't laughing and giggling. And right, and therefore there needed there was a rule that was broken that needed to be corrected. Mm -hmm. When you're a parent, you have to, well, I mean, uh, whatever, you should understand the difference between rebellion and childishness. So to me, you were just being childish, and and there's no punishment for childishness because it's just they're they're just little kids they're just not mature and so it's not rebellion it's just their age appropriate level so if we're brand new christians or five-year-old christians or 10-year-old christians even i think we should just all have grace for each other just like you would have grace for a child if you were if you're operating out of wisdom and understanding development of children it would be the same with spiritual maturity where you would just have grace and and be like, this person isn't doing this out of rebellion. You were just a little kid. Like even to this day, you're like, what did I even do? You you were just a little kid, you know. And so, rebellion is is wrong, but not childishness. So yeah. let's take it in a different way. Then let's look at it in another way. My dad's a minister. He's up there leading. And I, listen, I used to love to hear my dad preach. He was mm -hmm. really good, and he'd tell stories, and it was great. But here he's up there doing that. This event happens to me. So now, what is my view of God? Mm. Authoritarian, controlling. Doesn't understand you. Yep, you, you goof up, you get punished for it, you get humiliated and shamed for it. And you don't even know why. You don't even know what you did. Mm -hmm. You know, in listening to both of these stories of Jeff and David, um, <clears throat> I, it, it, what's missing is just standing out so so clearly to me, and I know we're getting into the next level, but I'm just thinking of what a powerful thing forgiveness is. It's like a soul hygiene, it cleanses, and that's the remedy in both the situations that you're describing. And there it is in, in, in Matthew 5, Jesus introduced a whole new way of relating. It's the New Testament, and one of those prongs, one is transformation, but the other one is forgiveness. So he couldn't have gone through any more. I mean, we couldn't possibly go through everything that he went through. And his response was, forgive them. To, to wash it, you've heard everything, you've done everything. But, but part of me, my heart was, was there saying, gee, I hope your father, uh, after all was said and done, he came in and said, David, you know, you got your punishment and everything and everything, but I, I want you to know, I forgive you. Just let's let it go. And the same thing. I mean, with me, whatever I did, I, I would hope after, after all you'd, of the things you administered <laughs> that you'd say that you'd get up to the next level and say, Bill, I, and, you know, I've heard from, from the Lord on this. and I'm just letting it all go, man. I, I forgive you. I'm, I'm, I think, you know, I think forgiveness is one of those things that that flips up it, into the higher. level. It absolutely flips. Model. But it, it's it's so powerful. And sometimes we take it for granted. 
But, you know, in my practice over the last, you know, 30 years or so, I see unforgiveness in somebody's heart. What that does, it, it, it gnaws, it eats, it, you know, and, and when you forgive, it's got this tremendous release. Or when you, for, when you receive forgiveness, it's got this incredible cleansing effect and brings peace. Well, and then that's the whole idea of law and order, too, when you think about forgiveness, right? It, it, because unforgiveness means I'm wanting something bad to happen to that person because of what they did to me. Mm -hmm. There's your justice. There's That's your justice. retributive justice, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, unbelievably, we're at 40 minutes already. Um, that just flew by. Let's bless the listeners, mm -hmm. and then we'll... We'll conclude this in summary next week. God, thank you for adopting us into your family. Thank you that you are a patient father. Thank you for not punishing us for our childishness, but training us in righteousness. I bless those that are listening that in whatever place they may have seen themselves as we've walked through this model, that there would be an immense grace to begin to flow mm -hmm. in. That's right. That they could begin to see you and all your wonder and all your love for us. And even to walk in, in forgiveness and in intimacy with you. Amen. Amen.